This is Noel Tate from the band Deleter, and you're listening to Into the Night, the Moon Knight podcast. Yes, welcome back, loony listeners. You are listening to Into the Night, the Moon Knight podcast. This is episode 297, I believe, and it's an Isla Ra sessions again. Yes, baby, it's been a while since we've done one, but the moon has aligned, kind of, sort of, and uh, and anyway, uh, it's time for another Isla Ra sessions. You're with your high pressure conchu ray, of course, and I am now sitting in, thanks to Jed McKay, not Grant Mansion, I'm not in the plush seats, I'm at the Midnight Mission. Um, so, you know, cold tile floors, just a, a metal table and a couple of seats, but I'm looking forward to a guest that will... Oh, there, there's a front door, let me just go grab it. Yes, hi, Drew, how are you going? Howdy there, I'm doing pretty all right, how are you? Yeah, good, good. I saw you saw the, um, I mean, you know, Dad, seeing the sign outside, the two moons. This is the Midnight Mission. Come on in, come on in. Yeah, you know, I looked an awful lot like the House of Shadows, which I normally <laughs> would not walk into, but what the hell. You can trust us. You can trust us. Uh, yep, yeah, so, yeah, take a seat here. Take a seat. Welcome, welcome, Drew. Um, listeners, we, we do have uh, a special guest here, Drew Toombs. Uh, top tier, one of the top tier Petrunis, uh, musician, uh, big Moon Knight fan. It's great to have you here, Drew, on the Isla Ra sessions. Uh, you've been on the, the show before, but uh, looking forward to uh, basically getting to know you and allowing the loonies to know you uh, a bit more. Yeah, it's great to be back. I didn't realize you were so close to 300 episodes. It's all, that's a lot of Moon Knight. Very, awesome. <laughs> very close. Yes, Drew, I might have to tap your shoulder for something else coming up too. You got it. <laughs> Big milestones. Uh, but for listeners who haven't heard of an Isla Ra Sessions before, it has been a long time. I think to episode 211 was the last one, last time we did one, uh, because a little something called the TV show came uh, and kind of caught out. Uh, caught our attention for that but for an Isla Ra Sessions listeners what we do is that we get an esteemed loony to join us uh, at the Midnight Mission we get to learn a bit more about Drew uh, learn you know how we got into comics Moon Knight that sort of thing and then we'll go into Drew's Desert Island books or as I like to call them the Isla Ra books now for you um, listeners fair listeners you can be spoiled and check out the encrypted links in the show notes to four of Drew's books that we'll be discussing tonight or you could just let let that be and just listen to the podcast and let them be uh, revealed to you as we speak uh, so this should be exciting Drew because I know that you yeah I mean obviously you like Moonlight but you like a lot of other a lot of other stuff in the comic realm yeah and that was part of the fun of trying to put this together is uh I I um I guess the best way to put it is uh, I obviously I like I, I have singular issues that I always remember and stick with me but uh when I read I usually read full arcs and I just keep plowing through them so I remember stories that I like a lot but it's it's was surprising to me how few singular issues I <laughs> thought of offhand to pick so the ones that I, uh, I ended up grabbing here were uh, not necess- I don't want to say they're necessarily ones that like I know like for an uh, desert island book it's something that you would want to read over and over again which these all are for me but it was more so i i think issues from arcs i and some of my favorite arcs but they were issues that stuck with me the most for specific reasons so like ones that really hit me when i read those specific issues of those arcs i actually i like that um that way of thinking drew because i do sometimes ask uh, people that do come onto the Isle of Ra, why you chose a particular issue, and and some of them may say, well, I chose it because uh, because it's something that I can reread again and I can discover new things as I read it over and over. Or or others say, you know, I, I like it because it's kind of entertaining. It's it's always interesting right. to know how you approach your your Isle of Ra books because yeah, if you're stuck on Isle of Ra, you've got nothing to do. 
you know, Sun King has destroyed everything. Uh, you, you're stuck with four books. You got to make the most of it. So, uh, yeah, I like it was, your it was idea. Fun for me to. Um, it was fun for me to kind of go back and visit these two because you know, for example, like 2015 Secret Wars is mm -hmm. maybe my all-time favorite comic story ever told. But I yes. and, I, and the, there were specific points where I was like, okay, if I had to pick one issue, well, what's the issue? Well, we can get into this later, of course. But yep. you know, for example, with that one, it's like, well, what was the issue where? T'Challa and Namor team up, and the thing fights Galactus, and there's an army of Maestro World Breaker Hulks, and I was like, "Oh, that's all in one issue." Okay, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it yeah. Was fun. It was fun to go back and pick out specifically where things that stuck out to me in those stories happened. Yeah, no, absolutely, and and a little tidbit there, loonies, as to what what is coming up ahead. But I like the idea that it actually springboards you or kind of triggers in your mind. Um, the, the greater arc and the arcs that you love so it, it's um picking these four books uh some of them at least um kind of a, a nice reminders for you about the whole arc which is a good way to kind of look at it and approach it uh before we kick off into just our general chat drew i mean i'm wondering are you are you partial are you, have you, do you are you partial for something to drink or uh something to to eat oh man i could go for a could go for an old-fashioned heavy heavy on I guess the fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, let me see if I, I actually I don't have Samuels here. I just remembered myself. We are in the Midnight Mission, of course. You know, it's not Grant Mansion, but I'll ask. I'll ask Reese. Reese, if you are, uh, would you mind grabbing? Fuck you. No. Uh, okay. Yep. Reese is obviously. I'm gonna be honest. Um... I didn't expect her to say that. <laughs> no. Uh, soldier. <laughs> soldier. After soldier, would you be able to so kind as to to dash out and and get. Uh, get through an old-fashioned from the bar next door oh thank you thank you okay so soldiers going out and soldier if you could get me a, a whiskey as well and something for yourself I'd like to yeah, imagine yeah. just walking over to the bar with no name and not quite sure <laughs> yeah. if he's gonna come back yeah that's right yeah just <laughs> just just name drop moon knight you should be fine soldier they're all scared of him um anyway so while we wait for our drinks drew uh yeah, first off, and look, I know we've mentioned this before, but for, for listeners that haven't necessarily listened to all our episodes or, or caught you in previous episodes, how, what was your gateway into into comics? Like, how did you get into them? Yeah, I mean, um, I was always into them as a kid. Uh, I remember watching a uh, Spider-Man cartoon, thinking it was incredible, not really knowing what was going on, or um, watching the, the old X-Men cartoons. Um, I never watched them consecutively or like knew what the running story was because I was really young when they were out, but um, I, they always stuck with me and I always really loved hanging out at comic book stores. I, I actually was really into role-playing games as a kid and my comic book shop was also a role-playing game shop, so I would go there to basically read through the D&D &D books and um, look at comics. and. I just, uh, it took me a long time to actually get into reading them because um, it was just hard for me as a kid to go every month and get new issues and uh, singular issues and everything like that. So I got really into graphic novels as I was uh, getting into high school and things like that. Um, that tends to be the way I collect things now. Uh, but yeah, I didn't start reading them heavily until honestly over the last like 10 years or so. And that was... Um, you know, like we've talked about before with the, the rise of the MCU, me and a bunch of my mm -hmm. friends are huge, huge MCU fans and have been since the beginning. Um, and I finally got to the point where I, I realized I could read all these things online or on the, the, yeah. the Marvel Unlimited app. It didn't have to go. Uh, I, I've grown to really love collecting issues every single month. And that whole part of it makes sense to me now that I'm an adult who has money to buy such things. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, when, once I realized there was easier ways to go about reading them than there was when, you know, I was a kid, um, I've just dove headfirst into it. And the initial push was so I knew more about these characters in the MCU and their backstories and histories. But um, it's mm -hmm. just become one of my favorite things is, you know, diving into these worlds, specifically the Marvel worlds uh, yeah. and getting to know more about these characters and doing deep dives on the ones that really stick out to me. Yeah, uh, that, that's so cool. I mean, I'll... I like the fact because I know that we've um, uh, chatted previously as well and during the TV show, like the Moon Knight TV show, and, and you mentioned that you would go, I think you'd watch it first or something at least for a couple of the episodes, then you'd watch it with your buddies, mm -hmm. and you kind of make a whole event out of it, which is, you know, you, you made these 
moon-based treats or something um, yeah yeah we would get like <laughs> we'd go to like koreatown and get what's called yeah. uh i think they're called like moon pies from the bakery and yes um we always have yeah. a pizza and yeah it was it was fun like uh, I, a lot of my friends where i live now uh my my, my main mcu crew um mm -hmm. is up in is, i'm in chicago now but i i lived up in milwaukee uh for 10 right. years before this and my main yeah. crew is up there but the, the people down here um, they know I'm really into it. They're not as into it as me, I guess. But uh, they all stuck it out for the Moon Knight show because they knew how much I liked it. <laughs> it was fun, and they all ended up yeah. loving it. And it led to um, a couple of them actually getting into reading. I've actually had nice. a friend, of, a good friend of mine, um, has now read the entire Lemire run, and wow. and he's uh, about to actually borrow my Bottom run and hop mm -hmm. into that. So um, it's been fun getting to open up new people to to reading those sorts of things. And it's the same sort of people as me that they were interested in it before but just didn't have the accessibility of it that we have now so it's fun to kind of show them yeah. that it, like it amazes me to think as well drew that at the time of this recording um for posterity's sake um lemire run was what a 14 issue run and now we're approaching jed mckay's 14th issue it's like really it's, crazy it's so cool isn't well, it well we know uh, the, we know from what he said on on the last time you had him mm -hmm. he's getting at least 18. 18 which i would is... be shocked if he doesn't go past that i would it would be really cool for us to see that and you know i i can't remember what the longest one is besides uh Mark the Spector. one that that nobody wanted to be that long but it would be really cool to see him get something that like is of that quality but mm. you know gets up into those numbers because i think he's really earned yeah. it oh no absolutely and and it doesn't hurt to have the you know the tv show and and the growing popularity because you know we're always astounded like you and i drew and, and everyone else i guess in the itk community of um just it's it's great just to see the exposure that moon knight's had and i've said this with rebecca as well like i never would have thought that the avatar for my disney plus streaming service i could pick moon knight <laughs> you yeah. know um those little things like he's been ingrained now slowly into into pop culture thanks to the the massive springboards uh that are D uh, disney plus and and the mcu uh just tracking back a bit drew like you mentioned when you you know you kind of dabbled early on during school uh, you got into a graphic novel phase like what were mm -hmm. the i'd be interested to know what were the graphic novels that you picked up um i honestly i, I put a lot of it on the walking dead um that was one of the first ones i nice. got into yeah um and honestly now that i'm thinking about it that might have also been a similar thing to the mcu i think i think the show had started and i knew it was based on comics uh, and I think I actually would go to like Barnes and Noble and just being a, a broke little punk kid, I would go grab all of the, you know, the, it, you know, books one through 10 of yeah. the walking dead. And I would just sit there and read them in the, in the Starbucks cafe at a bookstore. Nice. And, yeah. um, you know, that led into, I was, it was, it's funny cause the Marvel books were right there and I just, for some reason never touched them. Um, but I was reading like, uh, you know, Walking Dead. I, I remember being into Sandman for a while. I got really into Hellboy for a while, but, and again, oh, I think that it. was also because of the movies. Like a lot of my, a lot uh, of my comic exposure was because of enjoying the characters in film or in TV. Yep. And I think part of that is because the Marvel characters have so much history, and mm. being someone that didn't really have a lot of comic reading friends, I didn't have much guidance outside. And I, you know, the internet wasn't. Yeah. At least back then, I wasn't as uh, internet savvy as I am now. So trying to figure out where I wanted to hop in for a Daredevil series was a monumental task when I was 19 years old. Compared to now, I've, I've, you know, I can just look up what's the top 10 best Daredevil runs. Mm. And I guarantee yeah. I've read all of them. But um, yeah, it was so it was just a lot of like seeing stuff in other media and finding out that those characters had comic books that was the origin for all of their stuff and diving into those. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it is. I mean, it had been had been quite an overwhelming thing, uh, knowing where to jump on because uh, it's it's almost as if you're trying to jump onto a, a speeding train. You know, with, with comics in general, like mm. and, and with uh, characters as established as say Daredevil or Spider Man, uh, because um, you know they basically because they're serialized. I mean, they might have arcs and stuff, but that you, I guess, as a new reader, you'd be worried that you wouldn't. You wouldn't know what's going on. You don't know what oh, to get, sure. and 
And um, the things like Marvel Unlimited and uh, even just as basic as the internet, uh, it, it is a great uh, resource to actually get you know get hints. Um, if you don't have a look, I, I have I have no comic book uh, friends outside of uh, it's very much a, a, a personal just pursuit of my own, yeah. um, which I really enjoy. Um, you know, I started the podcast because I, I, I wanted there's to talk like, about comics. Yeah, there's a bit of like a. a I don't know uh, what the right word would be, but there's like a bit of a charm to kind of riding it solo like that for us because that'll lead to me reading arcs that I I thoroughly enjoy. But maybe if yes. I had taken the advice of a uh, mm -hmm. uh, tried and tested comic book nerd, they would have told me that that arc is garbage. Don't bother. Oh, so actually I've point, definitely yeah. hopped into some stuff <laughs> that I don't think people would have to told me to. Um, yes. But I really got I got to give credit too to communities like um, you know like. Your podcast has really helped me with my Moon Knight um, journey. Uh, the Moon Knight core page, for sure. Mm, like their disclaimer at the top of their page showing which arcs you should read. Mm -hmm. um, yep. We've talked about this in the past, but when I first hopped into Moon Knight, um, I started with the bottom. And then I, you know, I'll, I'll make this really brief. But basically, I know I'd started with the bottom. I got halfway into it and realized there was all these characters that I didn't really understand who they were. And I could tell it was a big deal that he was ruining their lives. Yeah. So I was like, okay, maybe I'll read something. Maybe I'll read something else that's a little more revealing. And I tried the Lemire yeah. run after that, which made even less sense. <laughs> so I went to the Moon Knight core page and I saw I read their disclaimer and I don't know which mm -hmm. order I went in from there. I think I actually just went back to the beginning and read all of them, which made it make yeah. perfect sense. But uh, yeah, ha th that sort of stuff didn't exist when, when we were kids. So yeah. I'm uh, while super grateful for having that sort of guidance now, especially, you know, like yeah. you said, me and you not having a, a tight circle around us that know mm. these things. Yeah, I mean, but also as well, like as you as you mentioned, um, you may have those that guidance and the references as well. But essentially, that journey is yours, and whether you choose to, as you as you went and um, jump onto Houston's run first, and then decide to okay, I'll go actually I'll go back, or I'll I'll go forward to Lemire. Oh, oh, hang on, that's probably a little bit too much. Let me go back. I mean, that journey yourself is um, yeah is, is is great, and I think it's a way it informs you of how you see the character as well uh whereas you know other people of course would probably watch uh probably read uh houston's run and go oh that's awesome and then just kick from there and then maybe later down the track check out the classic run so everyone's got their own way to approach it which i think is um which is really cool uh but yeah absolutely we, we're, we're blessed with a lot more references uh resources now moon knight core those guys are, are brilliant love them mm -hmm. so um if loonies if you somehow are under a rock and you don't know about them <laughs> because they are the, the foremost uh, presence for Moon Knight online. Go check them out um, for sure as well. Uh, oh, he, here's his soldier. Time thank you, soldier. There, there you go, Drew. There's your old fashioned. Oh, thank you so much, soldier. I hope the whole you know vampirism thing is going all right. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, soldier. And uh, I won't, I won't mention. I won't joke about Hydra again. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the past. I understand. Uh, yeah, but hopefully vamp vampirism. You got yourself a, a bag of blood, of course, of course. Uh, maybe you can share that with Reese. Uh, thank you. Um, speaking of which, actually, Drew, uh, just a little quick one. LCS. Have you got a, an LCS that you'd like to to share? I'm gonna be honest. What does that stand for? <laughs> oh, a local comic book, local local comic book store. Oh, okay, okay, store. yeah. Yes. So you know what? The, this is something I actually meant to spend much more time this summer diving into, uh, mm -hmm. and was just traveling so much that it never really happened. But um, I you know being in Chicago, there's a bunch of really really solid shops here. Nice. Um, I can't think of most of them, unfortunately, but I know I, I live near one called Challenger. Um, okay. Challenger Comic Shop. Uh, I believe it's on Western? Not totally sure. But, uh, yeah, Challenger Comics in Chicago. Uh, it's not the biggest shop. Uh, I know there's other ones here that are, are better rated and bigger, but it's the one closest to me, so it's the one I've checked out. <laughs> and um, they're great. I, I really like the shop. Everybody that worked there is super nice, so shout out to Challenger. I've, I've definitely oh. bought a handful of things from them. Oh yeah, and and I like it that they're a modest store as well, Drew. Uh, this is a, a little uh, something that I put in for Isle of Raz. I don't necessarily follow up on it, but I do like to shout out LCS's. No, it's uh, a around... great thing to do, especially with the, you know your guests being in different cities. It's always exactly. Uh, exactly. I like to check out comic shops in other cities when I can. So 
Yeah. So uh, Challenger Comics, uh, I'll I'll work on the details there. That will be in the show notes, listeners. Uh, check it out if you're around the area of Chicago. Uh, and so, I mean, I guess we've, we have talked um, about how you kind of came about uh, for finding Moon Knight. Um, and, well, I mean, like, we, we talked about the comics. Um, so Moon Knight specifically, like, it wasn't, it wasn't through the TV show. I know that because I know, having spoken with you with before, Drew, uh, you did check out the comics beforehand. You, you've been a member before the TV show started. Um, it, it wasn't through TV. <laughs> yeah, uh, when, when I say it, you'll remember and you'll have a nice laugh. Yes. <laughs> so... I, I don't know exactly where I'd first seen him, but yes. I know he popped up a few times on on just things I'd seen. I'm sure I'd seen Moon Knight Core memes uh, and was intrigued by that alone because this badass looking dude in an all white suit with moons was mm-hmm. right up my alley. Um, <laughs> but as we've discussed a couple times, uh, it yes. was when I dove into reading Damnation. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> I remember picking that up because I found the book at a local shop. Actually, I found the yep. tr- the collective or the trade book or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I was at the time looking to read Doctor Strange stuff, mm-hmm. uh, and I noticed that that I I I'd, I'd heard of the Midnight Suns. I didn't mm-hmm. quite know what it was, but I saw that cover, and seeing Doctor Strange, Ghost Rider. Uh, I'm trying to remember who else was on that. Elsa. Uh, Elsa. Um, oh, God. I, was Iron Fist on there? I think Iron no. Fist was. Yeah. Oh, yes. And then, obviously, Moon Knight on there. I was like, okay, mm-hmm. well, I've been wanting to read this this white moon guy. Mm-hmm. And he happens to be in a book with a bunch of other badass weirdo characters that I like. So I, I jumped into that. And even though his portrayal <laughs> in that isn't the greatest, um, yes, it was funny and weird enough that I immediately fell in love with them and I, I hopped on to finding, as soon as I finished Damnation, the next thing I looked up was reading more movement. Yes, I, I recall now um, when well just earlier in our discussion now when you said uh, there's that freedom of not of being able to exactly. discover things. And, I uh, love Damnation yeah. and I understand why people don't, but if I'd listened to the internet, I probably never would have read it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, it is a fun, it is a fun thing. There's I mean, a lot of dumb uh, stuff in it, but I just, it, yeah. it's, it, it feels like it knows what it is, so I can't really mm. hate it. It's a shame, though, that it didn't really kick on. It kind of um, teased like the Midnight Suns towards the end of it, and I know that we are getting a Midnight Suns later on. Um, it has been announced. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, Drew, but it's a, a totally comic, different line. Like comic yeah, comic. yeah. Did they announce who the lineup is? Um, I, just from memory, uh, on the cover, I think it's some people as disparate as, I think, Magic is in it. Um, Ilyana. I mean, maybe they're trying to make it more in line with the, the game that's coming out. Yes. Yeah, probably. Which I am actually pretty excited to try that game. Um, but yeah, I thought the the lineup for that game was another, yeah. you know, sadly lost opportunity. There's mm. adding in characters that don't have anything supernatural around them at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I mean that's the thing as well. Like, are you a gamer? Like, because a lot of people in, uh, get introduced to Moon Knight through the oh, games yeah, as is, well. This is a weird lineup here. It's you got it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's looks like it's a ghost. I don't know who a lot of these are to be yeah. honest. There are a lot of female characters. Wolverine's yeah. in it for some reason. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, but yes, right. I, oh, yeah, I've, yes. I've been, I, I'm not like a heavy, heavy gamer, but I've definitely yeah. been on and off gamer since I was a kid. Yeah. Okay. And d- and, just to note, sorry. And the people that are making that Midnight Suns game, um, they made a game called XCOM, which is like a, a sci-fi strategy kind of game. So I'm actually pretty excited to oh, try nice. it out. Excellent as well. And listeners, you may have heard some ticking, tick, ticking, or I don't know what you call them, clicking, uh, just to let you know drew did bring his laptop with him to the midnight mission so oh yeah yeah <laughs> when he's looking stuff up yeah we uh, gave him he, he got the wi-fi um, okay yeah. so this Just... lineup and this is interesting that <laughs> this is going to send me on a whole a whole rabbit hole of reading yes. this stuff now so here's uh, a lineup. give us a lineup blade kushala yep. uh the ghost rider known as spirit rider Oh, Ooh. so Kushala is the ghost writer known as Spirit Rider. Oh, okay. Yep. She looks badass. I just never heard of her. Um, Magic, Wolverine, Magic, yep. 
Nico Minoru, and Zoe Ooh. Laveau. Oh, oh Zoe, Zoe Laveau is from is Doctor Strange. Strange. Academy. Yes. Oh, and okay. she's also, I think she was introduced through Doctor Strange. Um, she's the librarian, I think. She she ends up being kind of like the, um, not the sidekick, but in the Jason Aaron run, I do believe, I think it's Zoe. She, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she, um, uh, she arrives at the Sanctum Sanctorum and, you know, hmm. I think, well, oh, okay, launches, so she's in, yeah. That launches early next month, so good to know. I'm going to go put a reserve on getting the first Neat. book of that. There you go. But yeah, I mean, so having said that, yeah, it was a shame because I did set it up kind of at the end of Damnation. Oh, and the team um, they had for it in that book was just perfect. Like, Yeah. It, had, it, yeah, Iron Fist. I don't know. Yeah. And it's fun. It's been fun seeing it get referenced. I don't know how many other comics have referenced it, but McKay bringing it up more than once in his run has been a treat mm. for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For nostalgia's sake, you know. Yeah. Sentimentality. Yeah. Um, Yes, well, I mean, not only is Moon Knight and, and comics a big part of it, but as always, like in these other rides, we want to kind of get to get under the skin, get to know the loonies a bit more, Drew. And for those that don't know and haven't listened to any episodes, because we do kind of shout it out um, each time, I think, Drew, your music um, mm-hmm. and, and DJing obviously forms a large part of your life as well um similar to like comics like how how did this come about have you just been naturally musical your whole life or um yeah yeah i uh, i mean i got into i was always obsessed with music ever since i was really young and um i played guitar starting in like fifth grade um mm-hmm. yeah i mean i played in punk bands and toured around uh I kind of toured the world from the ages of like 18 to 25 playing in, you know, punk hardcore bands. And, um, when that finally kind of ran its course and I got tired of being completely broke and pissed off all the time, I switched to producing dance music cause I was already kind of, uh, dabbling and DJing anyways. Um, okay. and yeah, I've been doing the tombs project for, I don't know, since probably 2012. Damn. It's yeah. Going on a, de- <laughs> going on a decade, decade now. Yeah, yeah. How do you, how do you crack into like DJing? Like, because it's you got to buy the equipment, right? I mean, just I'm just curious. Like, you know, if you want to, as you're saying, like you picked up the guitar and stuff, you're into the music. It's easy enough to try to get into that world because you start learning an instrument. You can, you know, you can form a band with your friends. Mm-hmm. DJing. How do you? Where do you start? Do you go buy equipment straight away, or? Um, I got really lucky in that when I was still playing in bands. Um, I was already into electronic music. I just didn't quite know how to make it or play yeah. it. Uh, but a really good friend of mine did. And we kind of started the Tombs Project as a duo way back when. And it kind of started where, you know, he had the software on his computer. Uh, I would come up with ideas and kind of sit over his shoulder. And we would we would work on stuff together. But And as we were working on it, he would slowly teach me how to, how to use the software and how to make my own music. And... Um, as far as like the DJing part of it, um, we just, you know, we saved up money together as like a project and we bought like a, a little DJ controller and we would, you know, mm-hmm. teach ourselves how to mix music and things like that. And, nice. um, you know, after that, it, you know, there's a lot of differences, obviously, but, um, a lot of shockingly similar things to being in a band. Like you, uh, we would, you know, try to get shows. We would try to go open up for bigger DJs, uh, when we weren't getting booked we would start throwing our own parties like our career started by us teaching ourselves to dj Mm -hmm. going to a local dive bar and telling them you know let us set let let us set up a fold-out table some speakers and our equipment and throw a party and if it goes well cool if not then we'll fuck off (laughs) um and and they 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 went well enough we had a lot of friends that were into it and uh that just kind of took off from there we we kind of did our own parties for long enough that the local clubs kind of picked up on what we were doing and nice. we ended up getting a residency um at a couple of the clubs in milwaukee that we were, were when we were living there yeah. uh and we just kind of you know obviously we were making our own music too so the, there's plenty of djs that just dj and that's fine but um yeah we were also musical artists like we were writing and releasing our own music so that started yeah. getting us on festivals and um getting us booked for traveling and 
Yeah, I've just nice. kind of wrote it out ever since then. Now that I'm seeing that it's been a decade, kind of makes sense that it's doing all right. Because <laughs> if it was doing worse than, the, than it is now, I don't think I'd still be doing it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it sounds like it's going great, Guns. And, like, you, you know, um, you only just recently, right, come back from somewhere? Yeah, um, I, um, yeah, I had a whole bunch of dates towards the beginning of the year. Um, I think I was gone every every other weekend or every weekend. And, yeah, mm. it's just been on and off throughout the summer. Uh did... Um, couple shows in texas and california a few months back uh did a couple parties at uh during movement festival weekend in detroit um yeah back in may and i just did electric forest festival uh at the beginning of june i think i played some something somewhere along five sets over the course of that weekend nice um yeah it's kind of downtime right now i've just been i've been going to other shows and things but end of summer is yeah. kind of winding down so just getting, okay. getting back to finishing up some music so kick it off and try to do some more tour dates in the fall yeah so is it not when when we talk about these gigs and uh these festivals that you go to again and excuse me because um i'm a little bit ignorant in in all of it uh so is it mainly just featuring your originals like uh it'll be a mixture of like that that's one of the fun things with djing is um yeah it, you know half of it is making is making your own music and half of it is taste making um, okay. So, like, when I play, uh, you know, I don't I don't bring my own equipment anymore. I um, most any club or festival has a setup that is uh, easiest way to explain it is it's two things called CDJs, which way way back would have been a turntable. Um, mm -hmm. I literally just bring a USB with my files on it. I plug that in and hook my headphones up, and I play off of folders that I organize on my USB. Too um, easy. So yeah, yeah my crap. sets, my sets, I I squeeze as much of my own music in it as I can, but it's also yeah. a lot of stuff that I like, you know, it's a lot of sharing music with the audience and building, building a vibe, telling, yeah. tell, basically telling a musical story, which for me is yeah. a lot of fun compared to playing in a band because in a band, you're obviously only going to play the stuff that you wrote or maybe a mm -hmm. cover here or there. With, yes. with DJing, I have an hour to two hours to to mix anything i want and try to take the people who are listening on like a audio journey for you know maybe a nice. little cheesy but that's the whole fun of it for me no nah, that's that's it and and like ex like take us through like uh because i'm you know genuinely interested in this i've got a lot of um uh musical friends as well um you know we used to jam and, and all that and and i you know i play musical instruments myself and uh, so i find it very you know very fascinating because this side of things like DJing's a little bit alien to me, um, mm -hmm. so uh, yeah, just really enjoy. Take us through like a like a typical gig. So it's a one or two sets, as you say. Um, you have that ability to um, to play, as you say. You mix in originals with um, what do you call them? Tastes. Uh, for, yeah. So just like other yeah. people's music, it's just you know I'm constantly yeah. hunting for uh, for other people's songs and. It's but you bring just, that with you beforehand, right? Yeah, yeah. So I organize yeah. all of that on, um, you yeah. know, I'm actually going to send you uh, a link to like a, a full like mix that I put out. Um, okay. That way you can get an idea of what it sounds like, like when I, you know, when I play for an hour, yeah, what, yeah. That, what that kind of sounds like cohesively. Um, but yeah, it's just a lot of uh, mixing my music with other people's music and putting together, yeah. you know, usually my sets are about an hour to an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Um and then just going from there and I, I you know some djs will get up and they'll just hammer you over the head with stuff for an hour and then be done i like to kind of tell a yeah. story when i'm doing things it'll start off chill and dark and yeah yeah I'll, the energy will kind of ramp up towards the middle and then i'll get into some weird stuff and i just yeah kind of yeah. try to make it something memorable that's that's not and it sounds as well from our previous chats as well like you know after the gigs and stuff you you, you take time you, you chat with people um or, or were, were they your circle of friends or, or do you kind of like um you know do, do you mix with the crowds afterwards because again like i'm thinking of like live gigs here like in australia at least a lot of pub bands um there really is kind of still a, a bit of a they're up on stage and you're with your beer down on the on the ground and you listen to them you enjoy them but there's mm -hmm. no real interaction like afterwards the smaller bands maybe yeah you know people are um but you know, uh, I like to think that would be it'd be fun to you know have a chat. Oh with yeah, I, I certainly try to. Uh, yeah, I, 
I mean, I come from playing in punk bands where if, if you have an ego as a punk musician, you're an asshole and <laughs> probably not doing it for the right reasons to begin with. And um, I mean, in the DJ world, there's definitely there's definitely egos. <laughs> it's dance music. So uh, and there's definitely people who are going to show up when they have to play and then they're going to disappear as soon as they're done. Um, yeah. And I get that. I, I'm a very socially anxious person most of the time. So there are times when like I play and I, I don't want to actually talk to anybody when I'm done. I want to just kind of hang out and listen to music. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I make it a point to show up and hang out, um, have some drinks with the audience, especially if my friends are there. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, when I'm done, if, if, if I'm not the one headlining, like if, if it's the end of the night and I'm the last person playing, um, I'll, you know, I'll hang out in front of the stage when I'm done, talk to people as the club's emptying out. But um, if I'm not the one headlining and there's somebody playing after me, I'm nine times out of ten I'm out hanging out with the audience because yeah, nice. yeah, I mean sitting back in my green room and drinking my free alcohol <laughs> is fun, but yeah, I would much rather just go back to my hotel at that point. I don't yeah. need to be sitting awkwardly in a corner. I'd rather be hanging out with people, and that's how you get people into. So I don't know. That's that's how you yeah. become memorable yeah. is meeting your fan base, not just hiding from them. Yeah, for sure, and, and like as well these days. Um, just wondering, I. I see you're, you're sporting a, from what I can see, it looks like a, a Tombs um, shirt. Oh, I, yeah, it's a really, yeah. really old one. This awesome. is, I think we made these like eight, nine years ago. We, I nice. actually have newer ones that I'm, my girlfriend's in the process of finishing up. I should actually be yeah. launching a, a merch store sometime over the next month or two. Okay, yeah, that's what I was about to ask. But I mean, you're right. There's, uh, the merch expands to obviously, um, and a to, lot of DJs don't do merch, so that's something oh. I bring from like being in bands. I, that's I cool, like yeah. having tangible products for like artists I like, and yeah, a lot. Well, of, about... A lot of the dance music scene enjoys buying merchandise, and DJs just don't take advantage I of that. It. So it's I'm something I'm gonna definitely be launching yeah. a merch store with like hoodies and shirts and a couple other things in it um, pretty soon. Yeah, I mean, that's cool. I mean, because again, um, just Old Man Ray is a bit out of touch because, you know, generally merch stores as well, you get your CDs. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people buy, do they sell CDs these days? Uh, I mean, I know still, bands all... still sort of do. I, yeah, yeah. There's not much physical format no. for, for dance yeah. music, but. Um, yeah, right, yeah. I mean, a lot of vinyl people, would be cool. Get vinyl. There is, like, yeah, sometimes vinyl, like, yeah. especially for people who play. Um, more Euro music uh, or mm -hmm. older music. Uh, I actually lived with a guy um, about a year or two ago who had a really massive vinyl collection and it was yeah. all dance music vinyl so it was really mm -hmm. cool to, to see that side of it. Yeah, vinyl's great. I mean, it's a great way to collect music. I think it's obviously there's a massive resurgence now that used to be dead for a while when CDs were, were the big thing. Um, but yeah, no, it's, you have a, you have a proper kind of setup for, for playing your vinyls. Um, it sounds really good. A mate of mine ha has got that and, um, yeah, he, he, he swears by it. Has all his funk music on vinyl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he loves it. Um, shifting back to, I guess, comics, Drew, uh, and I know we had a, a you posted up something um, most recently on your Facebook page. Um, just other other characters apart from Moon Knight. Uh, I know a big one was was Kang. Um, I'm yeah. looking forward to reading that. But w what other characters are you are you well into? Yeah, I mean, I, I I actually only recently got into Kang, and this was another product of the MCU. I've I've always found his character interesting. Uh, the thing with Kang is he's just always a villain in like Avengers arcs, and yeah. Uh, speaking of overwhelming amounts of stuff to dive into i don't know where the hell to start with an avengers thing almost ever for example the, the one book of mm -hmm. the one kang related book i have on my list that's in the middle of like a hundred something issue arc and i didn't bother to read all the stuff before it because it's just so much set up long oh, story this, short like yeah. uh his character i think is really really interesting in that that one-off series that you're mentioning the recent one i can't remember who the authors were but uh, Lanzig and Kelly. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that Kang solo series is great. Um, but as far as other characters, I, I got really, really into Daredevil. Um, yes. I pro I probably read m the most of him compared to anybody besides Moon Knight. How um, good is he? Hey? How good, so good are the Daredevil runs? I mean, like similar to, to Moon Knight, probably not as um, disparate like between volumes, but mm -hmm. just solid storytelling throughout um, and yeah just, and that's well, something that really stuck with me with daredevil is like 
trying to think how to put this. Like, I love the street level stuff. I mean, Moon Knight's my favorite character, and he's he's very street level. But there's a weirdness to Moon Knight, and yeah. I'm also a sucker for like old detective noir stuff and just like gritty crime drama. So I think there's something about that that sticks with Daredevil in ways that like I love Spider Man, but reading Spider Man just never really stuck with me. Like a lot okay. of a lot of street level characters, for some reason, their stories don't usually stick with me the way I want them to, and I think that's usually mm-hmm. just because of a lack of weirdness. Um, <laughs> Daredevil doesn't have a lot of weirdness, but it's just so well written and so well mm. done, and like has that detective noir feel to a lot of the arcs that I like the most. That uh, yeah, he he stuck with me pretty hard. He's definitely probably my second favorite. Yeah, um, I was into. I mean, I've always been into Doctor Strange. Um, well. How did you find how did you find Multiverse of Madness? I really liked it. I think it was a blast. It it could have I mean it could have been improved, but I I think compared to Love and Thunder, Multiverse of Madness was pretty amazing. Okay, I've not seen that yet. I can't I've gotta I've gotta go see it. But um yeah. Yeah, Multiverse of Madness, I thought it was good. I, I came out um not as uh, yeah, as you said, I, I probably was expecting a bit more, but I'm actually I'm looking forward to because it's streaming now. I'm looking forward to watching it again, just same, like knowing, uh, yeah, same here. knowing what to expect. You know, knowing that okay, this is and I love Sam Raimi, so knowing knowing what it's to expect very, with the yeah, film. Yeah, the Sam yeah. Raimi ness of it's one of my favorite parts of it. Like I, I grew yeah. up on horror movies with my dad. And the first Evil Dead one and two and Army of Darkness oh, was always so my, my thing good. growing up. Yeah, yeah. I may be bad, but I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love that. I love the one. I'm trying to is. think of who else like that I've really dove into. I got really into the Eternals, oddly enough. Um, okay. I've actually been reading a lot of the current Kier, uh, Kieran Gillen run. Yep. Is um, that good? I I really want to pick it up. I want to. He has done something with. So here's the thing. Like, I love the old Jack Kirby Eternals. It's mm-hmm. not really a whole lot to hold on to there. It's just fun. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the Neil Gaiman Eternals is one of my favorite runs. Oh yeah, ever. okay, um, nice. But every Eternals thing I've tried to read, other than those, has been not bad. Just like there's, it's a lot of characters, and there's not a mm. whole lot there for you to care about with those characters. Um, yeah. The way Kieran is writing this current run is he's done the way he's made their story interesting again is it's really impressive. It's really good, and. Um, I didn't really know what this whole Judgment Day event that's going on right now was, but yeah. I, I, on a whim, bought the first issue just to see what it was all about, yeah. and I immediately went back and started reading his Eternals run from the beginning, and I'm going to wow. read the whole thing, because like, I want to know this lead-up to what's going on in Judgment Day, because it is just insane. Yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah, you piqued my interest um, when I saw you post something up on social media saying, my God, like, Judgment Day is mm-hmm. the best, and like... You can't go past those bloody Mark Brooks covers. They they're just gorgeous. Yep. Um, and I had a I have like a surface level I guess understanding um, uh, about uh, you know the Eternals wanting to wipe out the mutants or something. The mutants are being yeah. It's kind it's, of it's not and... necessarily it's not really a spoiler. The gist of it is that it the gist of it is that there is a schism in the Eternals that that uh, what's the bad one. Oh, um, Druig. Yeah, Druig. that Druig is kind of stoking, uh, yeah. where the they have learned that the X Men now know how to be immortal. And mm-hmm. I don't read X Men. We've kind of talked about this before. Like, I don't have yeah. anything against them. That's just a whole chunk of the Marvel universe. I haven't yeah, had time to dive into. Yeah. But apparently, the X Men now have a whole thing where they can resurrect themselves mm-hmm. if they have a certain five members to do it. And mm-hmm. Druig is basically saying. That is like the the peak of deviancy, mm. because they Eternals are the only ones that are supposed to be able to do that. So, he's leading a genocide against the X Men with half of the Eternals and Thanos, and Ooh, Thanos is and well. so you have X Men versus the Eternals. But now you have part of the Eternals branching off with the Avengers trying to help stop all of that from happening. Okay. Um, so it's in a Sounds way cool. X Men, Avengers, and Eternals all in a huge cluster fuck mess <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> it's pretty nice yeah i mean i guess you could be burnt sometimes following these events from marvel because they do tend to 
kind of release them every you know every now and again. Um, but there have been some really good ones as well, as well as some kind of mediocre ones. If we're going to go back all the way, so Civil War Two for me was an absolute mm-hmm. waste waste of time. I thought, um, but more recently, stuff like I think Absolute Carnage I really enjoyed. Um, I haven't read King in Black, but I've heard that's actually really good as well. See, those are um, two that I want to check out because even though I yeah. grew up with Spider Man cartoons. I have not, I never really caught stayed up with his um, comics, and I love Venom, but I've also never, mm. I've admittedly never really read Venom, and uh, the yeah, whole yeah. King in Black and Carnage stuff I've been really interested in. It looks really good. Oh, look, if I can convince you to, 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 to dabble in Spider-Man comics again, look, you know, because they are a different tone to, like, Daredevil and Moon Knight, but for me, at least, personally, I find them really, I don't know, comforting, um... It's kind of like slipping on a glove. Uh, the yeah. story, well, well, stories when, they're, when, when they're, I always love yeah. when he shows up in other stories that I read, which tends to be pretty often yeah. given the characters I read. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But his own stories and and like the dramas that happen to his support cast and all that, I think it's just great. It just yeah. It, there's a really nice familiar kind of feel to it, and um, yeah, it, it's it's different to of course like Moon Knight and Daredevil. But two, two uh, other recent yeah. ones that I was super into actually, and this kind of ties back into your question about what other uh, characters yep. I really read a lot of. Um, Devil's Reign I thought was a blast. Oh yes, uh, Devil's Reign. That thought, coming oh, off oh, of Chip yeah. Zdarsky's Daredevil run, which is possibly my favorite Daredevil run. I, I don't know. <laughs> that's a, that's a hard a hard choice there, but. The way that he led Daredevil up into Electra Daredevil and into Devil's Reign was awesome. Mm. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. The, the, he just started the new Daredevil run out of that, and that first issue of the new Daredevil is great. Um, him and Spider-Man have a really wonderful little, like, heart-to-heart moment in that issue that I won't spoil yeah. for anybody who has not read it. But um, yeah, that was a really fun event, and I... Uh, I I never had anything against the Fantastic Four. I just, and to be fair, they kind of are cheesy, but um, <laughs> I just, they were always too cheesy for me. And yep. I ended up reading some of the Reckoning War stuff when it started oh, because uh, yeah. some other things, I was interested in like the Watcher stuff that was going on. Mm-hmm. And I actually, and this is, it's interesting because I've seen people talk shit on the Dan Slott Fantastic Four run. And I went back and read the whole thing and yep. I loved it, and yep. I thought the Reckoning War was really fun. The Watcher stuff was really fun, and um, I've oddly enough become a huge Fantastic Four reader. Yeah, uh, I've oh. been diving into a lot of old Fantastic Four recently. Oh, the old stuff is fantastic as well. Um, Tom DeFalco, I think Engelhart and Roy Thomas, uh, all those ones are, are really, really good. It's um, not super yeah. old, but I revisited uh, Solves Everything yesterday, um, okay. where Reed... Uh, finds out about the council of reeds and how oh, they're how they're nice. going around basically pruning dr dooms yep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, i don't know that whole that whole struggle between him wanting to solve everything and him yeah. wanting to have his family is like that's what makes them them really good like hmm. i i've yeah, that, really yeah. grown to appreciate the fantastic four because even when they're at their cheesiest it's because they're a family and that's why people love them Yes, they've got their own. If we're talking about Spider-Man, they've got their own tone as well. The Fantastic mm-hmm. Four comics, and you can see it. Like I've got the Epic collections, so from the very first appearances and stuff, I've been trying to read from you know volume one onwards. Um, and yeah, reading the first three volumes at least, it, it just permeates straight away. You can get this different kind of vibe with the Fantastic Four comics, and it's just so family-based. That's that's what I love about it. And Same, I'm to- but there's also yeah. like a lot of really hot, like the stuff they deal with is really high yeah. danger. Like, and that's what's <laughs> yeah. fun about it. Like, like when they yeah. got into the Reckoning War stuff, and yeah. you know, we're dealing with Reed having this forever gate that can take you literally anywhere and any time and any moment, yeah. any place. Like, yeah. it's just like the, I mean, the one thing Fantastic Four will always have going for it is like at least out of the stuff I've read, it's mm-hmm. like some of the best sci-fi in all of the Marvel. Oh yeah. Yeah, and and they are top tier. Like, if you're looking at teams and superheroes, they are top tier, you know, for any events or catastrophes. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it just it's even more amazing because there's only four of them. You know, Avengers have a, a, a cast of thousands. Fantastic right. Four, uh, generally, you know, you have a you have a rotating cast every now and again, but generally, are just four people who are all intrinsically connected to each other somehow. Um, and yeah, I'm with you. I'm a I'm a 
unabashed Dan Slott fan, and I, and I loved his Fantastic Four run. Uh, he's just a, a, fanta- a phenomenal writer. I've been reading a lot of his, um, catching up with a lot of his She-Hulk. Um, I was just going to say that's my other character I, oh. I've really grown to love, and it was because of, um, actually, yeah. it was because of the Soule, the Charles Soule run. Yep. Um, but that I really good. loved his, uh, I really loved Dan Slott's She-Hulk run, too. She, yeah. uh, honestly, my top three characters, my top four at this point, would probably be Moon Knight, Daredevil, She-Hulk, and Fantastic Four. That's nice. definitely my top four most. Oh, you bumped bumped off Doctor Strange. It's there. interesting. <laughs> I never expected that to happen, but I've just enjoyed these other characters. Like I love Doctor yeah. Strange, but yeah. at least in the arcs that I've read from him, like yeah. not many of them have stuck with me the way some of these other characters have, and that's that always yeah. struck me as odd because he. I always thought he'd be like my my guy but i think it was just the aesthetic of him that really sticks with me no i mean that that's fair as well and 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 granted dan slot had um he had a lot more canvas to work with with she hulk i think he had like a a 12 issue run and then a 38 issue run or something so it's Mm -hmm. almost like a 50 issue run um and he yeah just really brilliant a lot of the stuff i think they've lifted for the tv show coming up so oh big uh, time there's a lot of stuff from his run for sure and then yeah. um, some of the Sule, I can tell they're pulling from, but yeah. it's a lot of it's slot, especially with the, the uh, yeah. what's it called, uh, agency the G- or whatever she's working for. Yeah, the, the lawyer firm. Or G- it's a GD firm, that's lawyer. what it is. Yeah, uh, and, and Byrne as well. I mean, we can't forget Byrne's mm-hmm. uh, influence on She-Hulk as well. I love the fourth break, fourth wall-breaking aspects of it. So, um, yeah, no, that's great. Uh, finally, Drew, before we get stuck into before actually, you know, it's getting a little bit cold here in the, um, the main reception area of the Midnight Mission. Before we kind of delve deeper into the building, um, I just wanted to ask, and I ask this sometimes of guests, a, a skill or hobby that you'd like to share with us that not many people would probably know you have <laughs> what would that um, be <laughs> you know what this actually is a perfect opportunity so we were talking about physical media earlier right mm-hmm. um so my other music project that you advertise is lurk um i make mm-hmm. like sci-fi horror Fantastic. movies sound and yes. ambient music awesome um, music yep I haven't done a lot with it recently. It was something I really dove into over 2020 when I had the extra time to make weird music. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I got really into collecting cassette tapes. Turns out there's a booming uh, cassette tape collecting scene for like for like ambient music and um, things of that sort. And I actually, you know, this I don't know how well you can see this. This is actually like that Lurk album that I sent you. Yes. Nice. It's actually like a tape that I put out the over 2020. Cassette. Some so. listeners may not even know what that is. No, that's <laughs> been pretty pretentious. But yeah, I mean, yeah, that technology, long gone. I, mean, I we'll love that. S- I'm not going to try to spin my computer, but uh, I, yeah. I, have a, I have a wall of cassette tapes behind my desk. That, awesome. Uh, <laughs> that I got really into collecting over the last couple of years. So that's that yeah. I think that would count as a hobby most people don't expect, especially yeah, absolutely. when that's I have friends cool. come over that have never seen it, they'll stop and. Yeah. Is that is that a bunch of cassette tapes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have you got a Walkman? Like, have you? I, you know, I should get one. I, I have like okay. a really. I'm actually investing in getting a decent stereo for these things. Um, yep. But when I started collecting them, I realized I didn't really have a way to play them, and I happened mm-hmm. to find this like real shitty boombox in my basement, like the kind oh, that yeah. you would see construction workers have. <laughs> on site or something <laughs> oh nice uh, they're, good. they're hardy they're hardy but it just yeah, yeah well it just went out on me so i'm in the, oh, i'm in the market no. to invest in a new one but nice i walk lo- is definitely in the cards love any excuse to to buy something new way eh? so mm-hmm. <laughs> that'd be good uh nice one so there you go loonies I'd be interested to know uh, i'm just going to throw it out there if any loonies out there uh, are into collecting cassettes so let us know um i've got a whole heap of cassettes here drew i should send you a couple all the way from down under Oh, I mean, I have some extras in my albums too. I got, I, yeah. I think I put out. I mean, this is another one. I put out three tapes over the last couple of years, nice. so I, I, I'll have to yeah. put it together a little care back and just send you some. <laughs> I used to. Um, there's a really cool. I, I love them. It's a. If you're gonna look at it from a technical musical standpoint, um, you're probably going to be disappointed. But uh, there was this Aussie punk band that I used to listen to. Uh, called Whopping Big Naughty, um, awesome, awesome band. It's a fantastic uh, name. <laughs> yeah, uh, the lead singer, his name's Justin Credible, um, and he, um, uh, the first one of the first cassette albums I 
I bought was from theirs called Bed of Tits. <laughs> it was really, <laughs> really funny. Um, but yeah, cassettes, they're, they're just, they're great. I love them. Mm. And just like uh, with vinyl, I mean, it yeah. has to be for a certain kind of music, but like, you know, when yeah. you're listening to ambient music or like a lot of these tapes I have are like s- fantasy synth music. So like mm. the, the way a cassette tape sounds fits it perfectly, the same way vinyl oh. fits perfect or a lot of other genres too. Yeah, no, 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 for sure. That's right, and that's a very good point as well. I, th- I think it, I think it worked reasonably well for punk. Um, yeah, very much so. I, I still, yeah. I've actually seen a big resurgence in like punk and and like death metal bands releasing stuff on cassette again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there you go. Hopefully, maybe Drew, we should start a Walkman company. I think we might have to <laughs> cash in on that. <laughs> um, anyway, cassettes. Yes, <laughs> can't choose cassettes. Um, Anyway, Drew, if you're if you're fine with your old fashioned, feel free to take it with you. Let's um let's get out of here and um let's just walk through through here. Look, as you said, Drew, I do believe that this midnight mission is a bit more than it says it is. It is uh, the house of shadows. So I don't know where exactly. Let me try this door. Okay, yeah, that's uh, doesn't look too good. Pile of pile of skeleton, pile of bones. Um, uh. n- not there. Hang on. How about this one? Oh, okay. Oh, oh, a gaping maw. I don't think it's don't think it's possible that we can we can go there. Uh, last one here. Okay, that well actually that sounds pretty cool, Drew. Sounds hauntingly similar to some lurk music music, which I may insert discreetly into <laughs> the post edit. Uh, that's a very nightmarish sort of room. But let's let's move on. Uh, let's take a quick break, loonies. And when Drew and I return, let's see where the House of Shadows regurgitates us um, <laughs> out into, and we'll start to, to discuss Drew's four Ilara books. Reese, then. Reese, you're gonna wanna Reese. you're gonna wanna clean up that giant maw. Fuck. <laughs> no, she <laughs> yes, told me to, she told me to fuck myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll catch you soon. Hello, I'm Anthony. And I'm Dr. Issues. And we're hosts of Capes on the Couch, the podcast where comics get counseling. Superheroes don't always get to go home happy. That's where we come in. We offer psychiatric and mental health analysis of comic book characters. So check us out at capesonthecouch.live and across all social media platforms at Capes on the Couch. Hey there, everyone. I'd like to tell you about the YouTube channel I Am Your Target Demographic. If you're a fan of comics, we have plenty that you'll enjoy over there, including a series called Heroes Like Us that explores comic characters of all sorts of different identities. And we even have a series that defines words that are used in nerd culture that you may not know what they mean. So you can check us out by heading to YouTube and searching I Am Your Target Demographic or look up IAYTD on any social media outlet. Hey everyone, this is Phil and Lola of the Capes and Lunatics podcast. You're listening to Into the Night, the the Moon Knight podcast. Yes, welcome back, Looney listeners. You are listening to Into the Night, the Moon Knight podcast. This is an Isla Ra sessions. Drew Drew Toombs has uh, has joined for a chat. We've gone through some doors of the House of Shadows, as you know, we're at Midnight Mission, and a bit rocky here, Drew. Um, I've got a bit of sand in my hair. Uh, it looks like we're on the death barge here. I'm not too sure. I got some in my buns, so I'm right there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know what? You went there. That was awesome. So, um, oh, Tower it told me to. Tell, speaking of which, oh yeah, there, there's Tower How are you going, Tower Hi. So, are you two like twins? We love uh, Mark and Steve <laughs> ourselves. Great. That's really cleared this whole situation up for me. Uh, but we're going to try and stay on this death barge, Drew, while we go through your fourth um, fourth or first, however you want to see it. First pick of your Desert Island books it is Avengers. I've got here, I think I got it wrong, but it's, it's issue 49. Is yeah. that right? 49. Um, it's part of the Kang Dynasty, or, or also known as the Kang War. Uh, this, I mean, we were talking Kang just on the other side of the break as well, Drew, but why why, why this issue in particular to take to a desert island? Sure. So, like I said earlier, um, 
Uh, the way I read is more so in big chunks. So picking out individual issues was hard for me. And the way that I kind of went with it is just picking ones that stuck with me, even if they were recent. Um, mm -hmm. I literally just read this last week. And so that seems like a weird thing to put on ah. this list. Um, but it really took me by surprise. Uh, I, I, you know, when, when they announced Kang Dynasty Avengers movie at Comic-Con, um, I immediately, like, I knew that there was a Kang Dynasty thing in the comics, and I wanted to go figure out what that was. Um, every comic guide led me to start at this issue. I know that the, the story for this technically starts a little further back in this Avengers run, uh, mm -hmm. but as we've kind of discussed with the immensity of things going on in comics, I don't know what the hell's going on in this Avengers run. There's just, <laughs> there's just so much stuff in Avengers comics, and if you're not on board for the whole thing it's kind of hard to get it um mm -hmm. so i just started here and figured i you know whatever i'll wing it because i'm just curious to see what happens in this section of of the kang story and i did not realize until i got to the very end of this issue that there's no dialogue um mm, and solid issue. that yeah. really stuck with me one to just a couple points the cover is insane um kang mm. stabbing his damocles ship through earth it might be one of the hardest comic covers i've ever seen in my life um <laughs> but yeah just the story is really bleak uh you pretty much watch really kang win um mm. and nobody says a single word uh and at the very end when he's getting i think the president of the united states to sign a surrender agreement the president tries to say something and kang puts his hand up and he just makes him sign it and yep. the the title of the comic isn't even until the last page and it says there are no words yes well, he he, uh, Kang actually stops the president, and doesn't he motion for Janet to? to or sign that it? might be what it was, yeah. Yeah, and that's even oh, I mean that action alone. So it's all in the action yep. of the characters. But yeah, this was an uh, uh, yeah, a very interesting um, and amazing issue. Silent issues are always hard to pull off. Yeah, and I, I did, it made me realize how how little you see them, um, and mm, it really yep. speaks to the visceralness of uh of the facial expressions and what's going on that like i didn't even notice it was a silent issue until the last page um yeah i mean the avengers get their asses handed to them <laughs> they look miserable kang is just bombing cities and smiling uh <laughs> it's like he's a real bastard in this <laughs> um at one point he yeah. he nukes the whole city and you see these the skeletons kind of burst in this green flame, which yeah. reminded me of Mars Attacks. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, he laughs then, about yeah. it. Like they show, they mm. show Thor weeping because he couldn't stop it, and Hank oh, was laughing he... about it, howling. Yeah. Reading howling. this in ex yeah. reading this in preparation for what they're going to do for that movie, like mm. it got me really excited because part of why Infinity War was such a good movie is because we lost. Yes, that's hard to. That's a hard thing to do in Hollywood is to let your heroes get their asses handed to them and not fix it. Um, yeah. I have a really good feeling Kang is going to win and we're going to yeah. sit and watch it. And I'm really joke. I'm really stoked for that. It's because it's going to be difficult to really um, reach those heights. I think of infinity war because there was so much at stake as you said, Thanos basically he got the gauntlet. He had mastery over everything. And I've always found Kang to be um, like, annoyingly like in a good way just yeah. annoyingly um um unbeatable like bad because he, he's got he's he's a time traveler and he he's way ahead of you like you know you, you're trying to fight him with your 20th century garbage and he's like got 300 right you know he, he's 300th century you know technology um he's always a step ahead and it's almost it's it's like he's he's basically he knows the outcome before and you can do anything so i found him as a villain's like oh god he's going to be like literally unbeatable and so i think having him as the kang um the next kind of thing in the and secret wars afterwards for the avengers franchise and the mcu is going to be massive i mean mm -hmm. there's not many that can um reach those heights of say the thanos um you know, story. I mean, uh, gonna but be, Kang it's going to be frightening. Can. Like I, yeah. I think he's going to actually yeah. be scary in ways that Thanos wasn't. Thanos was mm. a force of sheer will, and it was awesome. But they they need yeah. to change that up. And uh, Feige and everybody has said like Kang is very different, yeah. and 
I don't yeah. know if you've seen or heard the uh, the lines from the leaked Ant Man trailer. Heard, yeah, I've heard of them. Yeah, uh, I've read but, them. So he yeah. he walks on screen and Scott Lang goes, "I don't know who you are, buddy, but I'm an Avenger." And yeah. he, he looks him in the face and he goes, "Oh, you're an Avenger? Have I killed you yeah. before?" Yeah. Because yeah. he's just been hopping around wiping these people out like it was nothing for fun, and mm. like. And it's not because he has some grand end scheme. He's just a he's just a multiversal time hopping bastard. Yeah, it's gonna I mean, be fun again, to see. If, if again, if you compare him to Thanos, you can you can see where that. I mean, I don't want to. It's got to be careful how I say this because right. you know, wiping out half the universe. But but you can you can see the logic behind what Thanos wanted to do. Certainly. Like you, he, he, there is something you can't deny that he and he his intentions, albeit the the means to what he wanted to do was was abhorrent. Um, his, his his intentions were there for the universe, for you know, for it to flourish. Um, whereas I think Kang, yeah, it might be a different beast in the fact I don't know his motivations. Right, and I, I I'm really yeah. curious to see how they do it because I don't they're not just going to give us a, a genocidal maniac who. Mm. doesn't have something you can latch on to um i i've been want as i tend to i've been watching a couple youtuber uh theorizing videos and things like that and actually there's uh there's a lot of i, I don't know exactly if they're from any um comic runs but um there's two things that i think will play into it that will at least allow us to feel for him uh mm -hmm. one of them being ravona um there's a uh, yep. there's a lot of ravona stuff in that king uh, recent mm -hmm. Kang series that you're going to end up reading um, yep. that really makes you understand part of why he does what he does um, and it ultimately all comes down to him telling himself that he should never love because that's the only thing that he ever is ever conquered by is love uh, mm. so he spends right. his entire existence trying to get that back um, right. so that's one of them two there's clips from an old Avengers cartoon where he is telling the Avengers he's doing what he's doing because he needs to save his timeline. Um, I mm -hmm. think ultimately where they're going to have it be where like, yeah, he is a real piece of shit for what he's doing, but he's doing it to try to either save something he loves or to stop the multiverse from collapsing while simultaneously yes. causing it himself. <laughs> Yeah, because we do see him in uh, in Loki, and uh, he's he, one of his variants, actually, the one that I um, can't remember now. Is that Loki that kills? Uh, yeah. Sylvie. Sylvie. Sylvie kills him. Um, but, yeah, so that was a, a like a, a grim forewarning that, you know, he's not the bad one. Mm -hmm. like he, he's You're not the worst of his kind. His he's variant, the one that so... put a lid on all the bad ones as long as he could. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So we're, I'm assuming we're going to see the... the extreme end of of kang in in um in the upcoming kang movie and and in ant-man and the wasp uh but yeah now this this issue um really good wasn't what i expected as well and i was surprised at the the silent comic format mm -hmm. um i i love seeing ionic energy uh simon williams wonder man uh, get the yeah. call up there um i loved how the sentinels like it, you know how they it made me kind of chuckle how there's so much trouble for the X-Men, but you got Thor and Wonder Man just, just flying through, through, through them. them. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah, this is nothing. You know, they're not even a worry. They're worried about Kang. They're not worried about Sentinels. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it speaks to his power when, when you know, he has an army of Sentinels flying down, and they just get tore mm. up. So he goes, you know what? Screw it, and he just throws down an energy beam and blows an entire city. Yeah. I mean, that was massive, a massive impact, something I just did not expect. And I'm going to have to go and read all the parts now to to this Kang um, War or Kang Dynasty as well. It just, it's just really heavy. It's, it's really not what good. It, 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 yeah. it leads into him, like, basically, it leads into him basically ruling the world for an undisclosed amount of years and setting up prison camps that all the heroes are in. And if, like, if... If one person escapes from the camp, they kill four other people in their place. So the heroes can't do anything. Um, yeah. But what his ultimate downfall is he forgets that there's Avengers that are off world. Uh, and yeah. Avengers things happen. They end up fixing things. But uh, it's really <laughs> grim. And it really paints yeah. him as a really horrible fucking guy. No, it, it does actually as well. And, and Busek, um does really well. I mean, again... 
Um, it is a silent issue, but he's obviously had a hand in the story and the way he has two bucks on my up. list. So apparently, yeah, I've, I've I was become a big fan of his. I was going to ask you actually. Um, we'll jump into the next one, but before we get into that though, uh, Busek, yeah, I mean, like, what what kind of draws you to his? Is it is it the characterizations, uh, the actual just stories and concepts? Um, so I need to you? go back and see if he's written other stuff that I'm super into because mm -hmm. I, I realized that I that him me having two of his books on my list was total coincidence. Um, yep. I knew that he wrote the uh, the marbles. Um, mm -hmm because I was suggested that from a buddy. Um, but uh, I actually didn't even realize that he'd written this Kang Dynasty arc until after I'd read the issue. I just looked it up by right. the number and like the story uh, the story arc that it was in. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. You don't, you don't, I mean, you do kind of see it a little bit and even in the silent issue, but he, uh, he seems to be obviously in the Marvels because that's the whole point of it. But he seems to be really good at grounding these next level otherworldly things that the marvel universe is full of and mm -hmm. grounding it in a way that you understand as a normal person how it would affect you um yeah. even in this avengers arc when they get into like kang running this prison planet essentially like you can feel how terrifying that would be as a normal person mm -hmm. like, living in that um, but from a great great perspective great yeah. a human perspective so it actually um, makes me really want to look at some of his other work because i know he's like one of marvel's most cherished authors um yeah but uh, if any of his other stuff is as good as the things I've accidentally read, <laughs> I'm yeah, yeah. going to be really into it. And and the beauty, again, of Marvel Unlimited, you can filter just Busiek I'm stories. I'm about to do and... that as soon as we're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, you did touch upon it. Now, this, for me, out of your picks, and look, I loved all of your picks. Don't get me wrong. For me, this was the gem. Um I loved it. Uh, you mentioned it just then, Marvels. So this is your number three, uh, your number two pick, uh, mm -hmm. your second pick, I guess. Uh, Marvels issue three by Busick and Alex Ross. Now, just for listeners that don't know, and I'm kind of unfamiliar with it, I actually listened to the audio recreation of this issue before is I actually... Is there an audio recreation of this? Yeah, there You'll is. You'll have to link um, me that. That sounds awesome. Because that sounds like a yeah. total War of the Worlds type. It was. It's fantastic. Like So Marvel released, I think through... I can't remember Sirius XM or something. I can't remember what they're called. Um, but they, you know how they had the Wolverine uh, audio mm -hmm. drama. The long, they released this thing called the Marvels, and I think it's got these issues on it. But for some reason, I had picked this one, which you have picked, uh, to oh, listen awesome. to, and it was fantastic. This was yeah, this so was a have, while have ago. Have you ever read any of the stuff? I think it's only like a six no. or seven arc thing. Yeah, and they've re-released. Uh, they, they've released more, I think, last year as well. But for any so, listeners, uh, Drew, that don't know it, yeah, the remastered any, edition. Yeah. Oh, that looks so. I've got, I've got to pick it, it is, up because I've, it is one of the coolest, best comic runs. Of the, uh, Moon Knight's my guy. Don't get me wrong. Yep. But yep. 2015 Secret Wars and this might have my top spots of my favorite stories ever. But uh, just just paint the picture then for the loonies, um, for anyone that is unfamiliar with Marvels. What what is it? Kind so of? it is the... it is essentially a story. I can't remember what the guy's name is, but it's essentially a story following a journalist who works, I believe, for the Bugle, um, and it just goes through the rise. It goes through the rise of the Marvel universe, um, and what it would be like from a normal person's point of view experiencing those things. So like. For example, uh, I won't get too far into it, but like the first issue is the emergence of the Human Torch fighting Namor over New York, mm -hmm. and yep. you get to see Classic like tiles. Namor flooding yep. the city, and then the Human yeah. Torch. Everybody's terrified of him, uh, but he saves the day. So that sparks this interest in heroes. Um, mm -hmm. I issue two, because this is issue three, right? Issue yes, two issue gets into the mutants. They start finding mm -hmm. out about mutants. And you get to see all of the racism and um, mm -hmm. extreme xenophobia that you see in all the mutant stories from the mutant's point of view. But you get to see it from a normal person's point of view. Like, he, his daughters make friends with a mutant child, and they mm -hmm. save her from a gang that's trying to, like, lynch her. And mm -hmm. this guy has to choose between, like, the safety of his family and protecting this mutant who's done nothing wrong. Um the issue we uh, we picked obviously it shows what it would be like from a normal person's perspective when the silver surfer and galactus came to earth um yeah and then it just kind of progresses from there you get to see like it's... 
the the uh, the Daily Bugle writing about the Avengers, then you get to see yep. a lot of the the um, uh, what's controversy around like mm-hmm. the Avengers when things went south. Uh, yep. Articles about Daredevil being a murderer, just like a lot of it is this guy trying to write a book about the Marvels. His book is going to be titled The Marvels, and his journey researching this his entire life. Uh, and watching the ups and downs and yeah. how people perceive heroes. And um, there's actually one of my favorite parts in the issue that we picked here. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you, you watch Galactus come to Earth and the Silver Surfer, the sky turns to fire. Um, yes. And then it all ends. There's a massive fight, all this crazy shit. And it all ends with Reed Richards presenting the ultimate nullifier to Galactus and mm-hmm. him leaving. And immediately, yep. the ne- all these people had been convinced that it was doomsday. They were done for. Mm. The next yep. day, the Daily Bugle has an article that James Jonah Jameson wrote saying that Galactus was a hoax. And yep. people are talking shit about the heroes and, and saying that it was a publicity stunt for the Fantastic Four so they could make money. And yep. the journalist has to go, like, what do you people need to believe that these people are heroes for the world to actually end? And yeah, you get to see oh, a lot so of that in, like Civil War and, and um, you know the MCU. Yeah. You get to see people turn on the heroes for good reason, but like, yeah, it's just such a it's such a well painted view of what it would actually look like as a normal person experiencing yeah. these otherworldly things. It, it is it is massively good, and and I'm so glad that you've kind of you've chosen it, Drew, because I think it's probably going to become one of my at least current faves. Yeah, um, if you ever I'm, dive I'm, into the whole run, let me know. Yeah, it, it really is some life changing stuff. He, he his love, respect yeah. for the source material is just the next level. Yes, well, I love it. I love it how it, it it's it's basically off the the classic issues, like the classic stories, um, mm-hmm. but it's from a different perspective, and it really struck me. So for listeners that don't know already, of course, we're we're talking about issue three of the Marvels of of Marvel novels by Busek and Ross uh it, it's just oh the, the one at the end where you know they they go through this whole kind of doomsday mentality and the next day you know alongside this hoax from J. Jonah Jameson and all that everyone just kind of is desensitized and they just kind of go about like they've just you know reco- recovered and almost forgotten the dire consequences that were were there just a day ago and i loved it how the writer at the end just goes look up in the sky he goes like do you, you know do you realize yeah so that was all so drew's um <laughs> just showing the picture of the oh, fantastic art from alex ross that yeah yeah as well. ross is untouchable on this it's crazy oh my gosh um but the fire in the sky which turns out to be kind of like an illusion right because it, yeah. nothing comes from it um there were the, these rocks asteroids floating in the sky it was all heralding like water fire and and uh and earth yeah all the uh, herald get... um galactus arriving yeah but it's just so great and i absolutely love this perspective that it's coming from like and the the heroes are painted just just different it, it's just a very different comic um it's it, it, just trying uh, to it's just so everything. realistic it like the way mm. that he paints the way that the bugle is because we see the bugle as you know, it's we see them write about Spider-Man being a menace, and yeah. most of the time it's kind of funny, and they're like, Tony Stark has a scandal, like, but the way he paints it's, like, very real. It's the way that we see politics written about in our modern mm. day, except for it's, it's like, the way that we write about our, our actors and actresses and things like that, yeah. like, uh, tabloid yeah, I, journalism, but about the people who just saved the planet. Yeah, and, and I think it really helps to have, like, a realistic like artist like you know alex ross um to pick that to, to really convey that um t- for you to be able to I, I guess relate to the type of story that's written from mm-hmm. this kind of human point of view you know because i'm thinking now like if this was done in say the style of and again no no slouch uh with artists but if this was done in uh say mark bagley right. art which is a lot more comic booky um, I don't think it would have the gravitas as, as say, what we get with the Alex No, Ross not art. at all, because, I mean, yeah. most of this looks like... I mean, even on the cover, like, look how actually scary yeah. Green Goblin and... Uh, is it Mary Jane? I, I don't know. Uh, Gwen, Gwen. Gwen. How, like, yeah. it looks frightening, because he would be frightening. Like, if it looked cartoonish, yeah. it wouldn't work. It, it looks like yeah. a, a grounded old detective novel, not a comic book. Yes. So when you do see the fantastic stuff, it makes it stick out that much more. 
Yeah, and um, and also the the era as well. I think uh, Ross keeping it all set it... back in the '60s when the like, yeah. '50s were written was was genius yep. because it wouldn't have made exactly. sense out of time. Yeah, absolutely true. And 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 again, so it conveyed beautifully in Ross's art with, you know, anything from hairstyles to to fashion. Uh, you really get that sense of that kind of classic more the 60s style um, but yeah and and for the large part of it really uh, like the Fantastic Four like they don't they don't speak in it they're, they're almost seen as like we're obviously getting it from the human perspective but they're almost um, they're kind of yeah they're kind of untouchable they're like these massive celebrities and mm -hmm. so we, we don't All we really hear, hear about them is like the wedding coming up and and mm. johnny storm being like a, a, a hot shot and stuff like but as far as yep. their characters i don't think you hear them talk so like no we all know as comic readers what that conversation was between reed and galactus yep. but yes. watching it from an office window by a bunch of terrified people and not knowing what they're saying it really exactly. puts you into the perspective of how exactly. horrifying being a New Yorker has to be <laughs> living through this sort of stuff. Yeah, you got it in one. It's basically the way it's portrayed is how we would portray it if we were in the office, and, and you're right. And, and I think it's just done so well by Busiek, um, you're separating, disconnecting the Fantastic Four and Galactus and the Silver Surfer from us, the reader. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're really as separated from them as, say, the, the general populace that are... Um, that are watching this terrible thing unfold. So, no, I could not, I cannot lure this one enough. I'm jealous of your, your trade over there, Drew. I'm, just, uh, I'm really I'm, glad you liked it so much. I'm really I'm excited for you to it. check the other ones out because it's, it's yeah. a lot of that stuff. Like, you know, first issue, we see Namor come out of the water and just flood half mm. of New York. And all you can yeah. see is people in the buildings that survive going, why? Like, what did we do? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that would be about what it's like. You don't know why Galactus came here to eat the planet. Reed Richards have... does, but we don't. Exactly. We don't have the luxury of that knowledge. Um, so a uh, really good take on it. Th there is, a, I think I did mention, so last year, 2021, so Busek returns with uh, another series of, of Marvels. Wait, he's doing um, but, that one too? Yeah, yeah, but Mar it's not... <laughs> Marvel and uh, <laughs> Yeah, but it's not it's Alex not quite Ross, the though. Oh, it's not. Okay. Well, it's not Alex Ross, oh, but I don't know. I haven't, I haven't checked it out. There's another artist. It could be just as good, you know, uh, but that... I think that's already ended. That was 2021 that came about. So Got that it. should okay. be. Yeah, I'd seen the title. I just didn't. I guess yeah. I didn't look close enough to see that it was him. Very interested to see what kind of classic issues that they'll latch onto and, and give us a, a human perspective on. And that makes um, me really excited because maybe it's some issues that have happened since this time period and we get to see more of like the 90s stuff or something like that. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I'll have to look into that. Thanks for letting me. Or, the no, or the thanks 90s. For the reminder. No worries. What we'll get? What like maximum carnage or something? That from a normal person, King and <laughs> yeah. Black from a normal person's perspective. <laughs> yeah, that would be a bit strange. Or oh man, if they do a Moon Knight one, I, I don't know which one they'll do. Um, you know, if they do Damnation, <laughs> there we funny. go. <laughs> um, but yeah, so those are, are ranked. I, look, I've got here on the list ranked the fourth and third of your picks here, Drew. So, um, so loonies, definitely go check them out as well. They are uh, worth worth uh, diving into. Um, I mean, you've got the vast collection of the Kang um, story arc there to, to catch up on, all on Marvel Unlimited. And yeah, Marvels, I cannot stress enough. Maybe I should wait, Drew, wait for, maybe there's a, a collected hardcover omnibus edition of the Marvels, like these two runs from, um, yeah, I mean this uh, when this, that was... this remastered edition didn't come out that long ago, so I'm sure this is still okay. pretty readily available. Oh, okay. That's I mean, me I found it. this. I found this at a Barnes and Noble. Oh, so it's me on Amazon. Yeah, it's, gonna, it definitely would be. We're gonna go check it out as well. Uh, okay, well, Drew, how about we um, we get off this barge because I don't want to fall off, and uh, I, I know that you've been tapped on the shoulder by a couple of sand zombies. Uh, so coming up out of the duat <laughs> coming up out of the duat so um why don't we just take a quick short break again we'll go inside tell where it um if you can just please lead, lead us inside hold on a sec it's been a minute since we've had a soul pass through here and uh we'll we'll uh, look at your top two our uh, books so loony listeners catch you then 
See this episode's show notes for our unique promo code to get up to two months of free podcasting service with Libsyn when you sign up for a new account. Get your show on Apple and Spotify. Get helpful stats and all the support you need to sound your very best. The creators of Tomes of Evil are about to unleash something new. Hello, all of you Gamma Beasts out there. It's time to step through the green door. Gamma Charge is the only dedicated Hulk podcast on the internet. Bringing you the Green Goliath and his supporting characters, can't forget about Jen, in all forms of media, comics, film, TV, video games, and more, coming in March. And please, don't make us angry. You won't like us when we're angry. I'm Ann Nocenti, and you're listening to Into the Night, the Moon Knight Podcast. Yes, welcome back, loony listeners. You are listening to Into the Night. This is the Isla Ra sessions. We are down to the top two Isla Ra books for Drew Tombs. Uh, turntable Tombs. <laughs> I've forgotten to add you. There we go. <laughs> Turntable tombs. Uh, Drew, uh, a couple of rippers there for, for rank third and fourth. Um, we are in a different setting now. It, it's a little bit busy. It might be a little bit loud. We're on Battle World. Um, the you, you House know, of Shadows has, yeah. I was wondering how we ended up here, but it, it looks like we ended up in Doom Guard where all of the core, the Thor core. Are hanging out, so at least we're surrounded by drinks and partying. Oh, that's true. I thought you were about to say at least we're surrounded by authority, which you know, I'm not sure if that. Well, on Doom's world, we're constantly surrounded by authority. So, <laughs> true. At least we're not up on the ship with the maestro. So, yeah. all I can say is that. So, anyway, listeners, we are alluding to, of course, Drew's number two desert island book. And it is Secret Wars. Now, again, I've listed here, Drew, and, and with your permission, Secret Wars issue seven. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it was a hard one for you, right? We're talking more like um, the end of Secret Wars, the, the Hickman yeah. um, run. Yeah. And, and to go with what I said earlier, the, I was picking ones that stuck with me the most for specific reasons. And even mm-hmm. though the 2015 Secret Wars, uh, every issue is a complete mind fuck of things going on. This one, more than any of them, I realized, like, I kept trying to think which issue had this crazy thing in it, which issue had this crazy thing in it. Turns out yeah. issue seven had just about half of the crazy things I was thinking. <laughs> so it, yes. I, it was one of those issues where I remember reading through it and just going, what the hell Hickman is a madman? Yes. 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 Uh, from memory. So this is 2015. I remember when I was um, thinking, so, yeah, I, I got the whole thing. I collected all the, the crossovers, the battle worlds. Um, I love there was a Marvel Zombies one with Elsa Bloodstone. Mm-hmm. I love that battle world one. But there are a whole heap of them. Uh, but yeah, this the Secret Wars 7, a lot does go on here, Drew. Um, first, I mean, we get the likes of it kind of opens up with Maximus, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and he's begun uh, leading. To, um, He's been yes. calling himself the prophet and leading uh, a quiet rebellion against the Doom's authority. That uh, he's kind of yeah. working with the heroes to undermine Doom's yes. authority while they they work to fix everything. Exactly, and and in a nutshell, Doom. Or we should just call him Emperor God Doom. He's obtained a, a, an insane level. Um, from memory, Drew, again, please correct me if I'm wrong. He, he takes on the Beyonders or something, and he actually uh, um, assimilates something from them. Yeah, I mean, there's several different things going on in Secret Wars, but his part of it is that he... One of the incurs- incursion worlds, somehow a piece of it landed in uh, Latveria, and he was able to pinpoint 
where it came from, which led him to know where the Beyonders were. Uh, he started working with the Molecule Man, and if I remember correctly, he spent years and years while while like the Illuminati is working on destroying Incursive Worlds, and the Cabal is destroying Incursive Worlds. Doom is taking a different route, where he's going around universe to universe, destroying every different variant of the Molecule Man, and every mm. single time he he kills one of the molecule men he gathers his power uh mm -hmm. and eventually he takes on the power of the beyonders by using owen reese uh i don't remember the exact details but essentially he's he's taken the powers of the molecule man and, and absorbed the powers of the beyonder um that Massive. way when everything collapsed he was able to use that power to pull pieces of different realities and smush them together uh, mm. and also effectively wipe everyone's memories thinking that that's how things always had been and that he'd always been their god. <laughs> Which um, is the most Doom thing ever. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, pretty much sounds like a Hickman story, don't you reckon? Yeah. Um, <laughs> when he's, there's a lot going on here. It was, yeah, I remember first reading it as well. I'm just being wowed and uh, floored by just the the concepts that hickman throws around and it's such a it's such a complicated i guess task to to involve the incursions and the collisions of universes um you know that's massive uh, but yeah you, you you get a sense of it here and uh, loonies that haven't read secret wars and are looking towards uh now secret wars issue seven which is in the show notes urge you to to really at least read um, the core books of Secret yeah. Wars to get an overall and, sense because and this was one of those where I jumped into this story because I'd heard the name Secret Wars, but it mm -hmm. led me to going back uh, and reading the books leading up to it. And honestly, like the the Avengers, the new Avengers, and whatever, there's two different Avengers runs happening simultaneously, but it mm -hmm. turns into time runs out. Um, yes, and that yeah. is essentially what I think the MCU is starting right now i think time mm -hmm. runs out is going to essentially the incursions are started and you get yeah. to watch everybody on earth trying to learn how to deal with that coming up um illuminati avengers yada yes. yada but uh reading that whole arc coming up to secret wars made this hit so much harder and make yeah. way more sense too <laughs> Well, yeah, it's, it's, and there are a fair few issues to, to, to read before Secret Wars. Yeah, I guess, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty healthy undertaking. Yeah, uh, uh, Avengers, and I think it was Avengers World. With That's what it was, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, so, uh, yeah, definitely worth reading. And you're right, they, they do start mentioning it. Um, for, most notably for me, uh, Mr. Fantastic from Multiverse of Madness. Mm -hmm. um, Reed hearing, talks about incursions. Hearing him say incursions uh, on yes. screen, me and my buddy that got me into Secret Wars, we, we shouted like school children. Yeah, oh, me too. It was just like, yes, oh my God. Because incursions, it's um, it may mean nothing to the casual viewer, but for us, it, it means a massive amount. It, it means a whole of, lot, yeah. Yeah, it was it was like you know it was like Miles Morales meeting Peter Parker, you, you know yep. those universes. So it's it's a massive thing. Um, but yeah, so Secret Wars Seven. Uh, I mean, you probably roundabout answered it already, Drew. But um, this was obviously the the love for this arc and the I guess the complexity is probably why maybe you chose it for Desert Island books. Yeah, and I, and honestly, this one I can run through kind of quick um, because yep, th there's so much story that there's no point in trying to break down why each point is awesome. Yes, it, this is mostly we're getting to the fever pitch of the of this arc, and we're essentially seeing like where the the main fighting is going to pop off. So it's just a lot of really yep. cool things happening one after another. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just go down my list essentially. Yeah, um, sure, sure. Uh, and one, I don't know if I have not read much about Black Panther. So if he said this mm -hmm. in others, if he has said this quote somewhere else before this, um, yeah. definitely someone correct me. But um, mm -hmm. one of my favorite parts is uh, when when Chadwick Boseman passed away, and you started seeing Marvel Comics putting um, those little uh, memorials to him in the issues. There was mm -hmm. always a quote where it said, "Death is just a different kind of journey to the land that I am king of." He mm. says that in this issue um, when yes. he's talking to Namor and Namor says something about how he's pretty sure they're going to die. Um, mm -hmm. He says that line. So it's pretty cool to see that this like this quote that Marvel has taken from T'Challa to memorialize yes. um, Chadwick Boseman as an actor uh, came from this issue, unless he said it somewhere yeah. else. 
Um, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know, but yeah, that that is remarkable. That yeah, that that it is this issue as well. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think he did. He say something similar in the movie. I don't know. Uh, I anyway, think he I'm did just, too. Uh, he might yeah. have when he went to um, when he comes back from the ancestral plane. He might have said something like that. Yeah, but that would have been a reference, in the movie right? To right. This. Yeah. So, so I, I just picked up on that one rereading this today. So that was one thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Really cool part where namor he he actually a uh, black panther gives this whole speech and namor just sits and talks shit on it he's like oh you almost made me cry <laughs> yeah, exactly um, yeah exactly but then you get to yeah. watch them work together which obviously if you know yeah. namor and t'challa's history mm. watching them work together to take down doom is a pretty big deal um, it is it's like getting you know two badasses together who just hate each other and so. i've been fighting for who knows how long yeah, yeah um yeah. Uh, they let in the Marvel zombies, which have been being held back by a wall made out of the thing. Um, I love, I love Captain Britain in there. Yeah, just Captain with Britain, go goggly um, eye. Yeah, yep. <laughs> it's just they're super cool. Yeah. Um, Jane Foster has gotten all of the Thor Corps, who basically act as Doom's police guard. Um, she's gotten all of them to turn on Doom, so it's pretty awesome to uh, see Jane Foster leading all of the Thor variants and saying that they're yeah. going to smite a god. Yeah, uh, that's, that's so, so pretty cool. Pretty badass. I, I loved actually. It was maybe it's just in my head, but there's a one panel of, and a close up of Doom, and he just says his eye, and he just says, "Oh, I'm being betrayed." Betrayed. And it was, that again. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> it it just conveyed this kind of almost. I'm slightly pissed off. I'm tired of the fact, you know, that all that all round rounded into one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I loved it. It was just perfectly written and drawn with just that weary eye mm -hmm. going, yep, yep, of course, of course they're going to go against me. Um, uh, so, yeah. no, that was another one. Yeah. Yeah, cool. so and then the rest of it's just little, little bullet points of things getting crazy. Um, uh, a ship shows up with Maestro yes. leading the ship. And Waiting he for has, you to say that. And yeah. he has an army of hulks from his, his <laughs> yes. Greenland that he's been running. Uh, and smash, 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 you watch smash, him, smash, smash, yeah, you watch him say <laughs> world breakers go and, uh, yeah. hundreds of world breaker hawks jump off of a ship going smash, 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 smash. That is, that is a massive, oh, I, I love that moment just cause you know, being a bit of a Hulk fan and seeing the maestro, it always kind of I, sits uneasily with me that the maestro is actually, um, you know, under, under doom, but I guess, you know, doom is. Uh, he's, he's up there because um for the the maestro for me is is you know tantamount to unbeatable mm -hmm. but uh it was just fun to see him in his ship um and and, and the then to watch thing, giant, oh, giant ben Grimm come and smash his yeah ship. <laughs> yeah, yeah and then subsequently that, yeah. fist fight galactus <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly so i know Hick, a lot of being hickman hickman being hickman loonies are probably li listening to this going what ben yeah Grimm's see that's giant, exactly but... why secret wars is worth reading yeah, it um, is. It's and massive. then one of one of the last things, the two the two final things in this issue that really blew me away, uh, Peter Quill is piloting. Um, I don't even remember who he's driving around, but he's part of the mm -hmm. the secret mission to undermine Doom, and he is about to get killed by one of Doom's helpers, Black Swan, and he pulls yeah. out this tiny piece of wood, and he he says some some quip. He th so the, the entirety of Doom's Citadel is built on what he calls the World Tree. So we all assume mm. it's like Yggdrasil or something like that. Yep. Quill throws this piece of wood on this tree, and it turns into a massive... It's Groot. You find out it's been Groot the whole time. <laughs> so Groot yes. destroys Doom's Citadel by, like, growing out of it. Yeah, um, yeah. And essentially it ends with... Um, Doom has essentially decided, you know, fuck this everything's trashed uh yeah. he goes down to handle things himself and he runs into thanos and thanos yeah. basically gets in his face and says you're a poor excuse for a god uh you know when i was a god i did this this and this alluding to when he had the infinity gauntlet and mm -hmm. he said something like you know it doesn't really matter what he says he gets up in his face talks his shit and doom just breaches in his chest and pulls his entire <laughs> spine and skull out Excellent. And then drop As you do. It. And uh, <laughs> watching Doom despine Thanos might be one of the hardest moments in any comic ever. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it certainly... And we were talking about, um, like, hits and misses with events. Uh, Secret Wars certainly is a... Look, this was one of the ones that I was looking at and uh, when it came out and all the tie-ins all across... And there were lots of them. They all really just 
added and complemented uh, the the main story. Like yeah, the whole it seemed books. very cohesive all around. Oh, it was so it was such a great event to go through. Oh, it's a huge one as well. And uh, we can't we would be remiss if we didn't talk about um Asad Ribic's art as well. Like, you know Oh it's, it's talk, just great. Yeah. I mean we talk about Alex Ross and the Marvels. I mean Ribic as well has done some monumental classic. Well uh, his tales. style the, in the same way yeah. that um in the same way that Ross's stuff works for the Marvels, uh yep. Ribic's really works for this because this is such an outlandish and massive and in a way goofy story that mm. his more like serious and gritty art style makes it like it makes it dark and it's like a very dark hero sci-fi um if this yeah. was done by a more comic booky artist it would have just turned mm -hmm. into a big silly thing yeah yeah i think because of the concepts of Hickman and stuff, it, it just it just adds to that grandeur. Mm -hmm. I think of the, the tale and the epicness of it. Um, so yeah, I mean nine issues for the core books, um, which was a good canvas, I think, to to actually tell the main plot and the main story. Um, but certainly, listeners, check out all the um, connected. They should all be on Marvel Unlimited as well. Just check out all the tie-in books. Um, there's some great ones. There's, there was one Master of Kung Fu as well. Even the ones that you wouldn't even associate. Um, uh, Adelaide Rising has an in Inhumans version uh, story, um, but uh, oh my god, there's a Future Imperfect as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are all these these ones that really kind of flesh out the world. And and um, I remember as well, Drew, that Hickman had created it was almost like a Lord of the Rings map of a battle world. Of battle and, world, yeah, yeah, which is again, it just. He's turned it into like a fantasy level um, kind of event. Yeah, is... just just the story, Lee, like, I don't know, the amount of, of forethought that went into making all of this make sense is just nuts. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, we are on Battleworld now. It, it's very, you know, there are zombies here. There are maestros and... <laughs> Venom's here, uh, Drew. I think we we better step out into something a little bit um, a bit more serene. And uh, so I see a door here from the, the House of Shadows. We can go through that and let's um let's look at your final your final book. So let's just go through this door. This feels a little nicer. It's a, a drippy, stinky New York alleyway. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, for sure. Uh, <laughs> unless, unless that wasn't where we we're going. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're we're here. No, that's good. It actually, feels a bit. Like, I think we're in Hell's Kitchen now. Oh, thank um, God. Uh, the House of Shadows must have listened to us. Must have known of our love for Daredevil. It has dropped us into a stinky alleyway. Um, you know, vagrant here, uh, rubbish there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but. This certainly makes... Oh, better watch your head as well, Drew, because things may fall from the rooftop, if you know yes. what I mean. Um, the number one book here, Loonies, from Drew Toombs, Drew Turntable Toombs, one of our esteemed Patronis and Looney members, is none other than 2006's Moon Knight, issue one by Charlie Houston and David Finch. The now, fun Drew, stuff. Look, the fun stuff. I mean... Oh, it all it feels like, you know, we've returned home, so to speak. No. Uh, I like this that we one... saved this for last. I have the least amount to yeah. say about it, but it it, it, <laughs> it brings it all back to Mooney. It brings us back to Mooney as well. And, okay, well, I mean, there are a, a, a billion gazillion reasons, but uh, why would you pick this one, uh, issue one? It was or... the very first Moon Knight comic I ever read, mm -hmm. and I never anticipated any Marvel character. Granted, this is... Uh, this is a very um, specific uh, exception. I mean, there's a lot of dark, dark Marvel stuff, but uh, I never no. expected to pick up a Moon Knight book and it be this gritty and grim and right up my alley theme-wise. Um, yeah. It really blew me away. Um, the, the cover art drew me in right away, especially coming from Damnation. Uh, mm -hmm. He just looks... He just looks so badass. Finch's art is insane. Um, yeah. And just, you know, not knowing much about his character, the way that the book opened with him, you know, saying, 
the world savers have their own jobs. You know, if a giant monster pops out of the ground, you call the Fantastic Four. Magneto's trying to wipe out the human race. You get the X-Men. Uh, invasion of alien vessels, that's what the Avengers are for. Daredevil's stuck in Hell's Kitchen. He's not going to come to Spanish Harlem. Spider-Man's got the U.S. supervillains, so I get the fun stuff. So right away, as somebody who's never read this, I yep. get what he's talking about. He gets it's to great, take out yeah. the... He's like the Punisher in that sense. I knew the Punisher at the time, so I was like, oh... You get to take out the trash, essentially. But yeah. he is he's reveling in it. And for this to be the second thing that you see, just mm-hmm. the spread of him flying with the moon in his cape, and uh, I immediately was like, this is like it took two pages for me to be like, this is my favorite character. Yeah. No, it, it's it's a, a phenomenal. It really did bring Moon Knight into the modern age, didn't it, as well? And I'm just trying to track back. I think it was 1998 or maybe 2000 was the last time that we saw Moon Knight uh, in Resurrection War or High Strangers. I can't remember which one. And then there was a, a, a yawning gap. And then 2006, so at least six years later, we get almost like a, a reinterpretation of Moon Knight through Charlie Houston. And I, I think coupled with the David Finch art, it does bring him... In, I mean, of course, there's that grittiness to it. And it's it's a far cry from uh, the Doug Mensch and Sienkiewicz uh, 80s run. Yeah. Uh, he's, 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 he's ripped with muscles. Uh, he's, the rain is on him. He's sweating. He's bleeding. Uh, you know, very kind of earthly kind of sort of stuff. And, and even the look of Bushman in, that, um, in the issue mm. is... You know, and actually, the opening gambit as well with him in the speeding car. Yeah, it's such uh, a cool, it's such an awesome, fluid action scene. Yeah, um, yeah. And just violent in a way that you didn't see characters. And I know that, like, I have grown way past Moon Knight, my love for Moon Knight being because of his violence. Um, mm. I know oh, that's yeah. always going to be part of his character. Uh, but yeah. a lot of people think because of this run, that's, that's a prerequisite for Moon Knight. Um, I don't yeah. think that anymore. But when I first read this and I wasn't familiar with the character that that certainly pulled me in because I'd never seen somebody just be ass like this without caring about it mm. or even and, re- and the, or, or reveling in it even. yeah for sure and, and like I mean you do get that in the of course you get that in the sense with the Bemis and the McKay run that violence but I feel maybe that you know in some way we are turning the corner of him just being a generic tropey badass yes. you know ass kicker i'm um, watching him lot... do this and at no point am i thinking like yeah. oh he he's like somebody i really look up to like batman it felt good mm. to watch this guy do this badass stuff and kind of feel like <laughs> weird about yeah. liking it you know what you're supposed yeah. to like there's yeah. some really problematic stuff he does in this issue that oh. makes me upset and like Absolutely. Uh, you know, as someone who'd never read Moon Knight, watching him like hit his girlfriend, which really sucks that he ever mm-hmm. did that, but like yeah. being addicted to pills, I you know I don't know why he's in this state. Like yeah. that stuck with me more than any comic book ever has, because yeah. I had never read something that made me so badly want to go back and find out what put this guy where he is. Mm. Yeah, you don't you don't see that with many cat like he's absolutely rock bottom, and, and, and they know, don't say the... why. That's the beauty of it. Nah. It's like. A lot yeah. of comics would hand feed you why yeah. this guy is where he's at at the first issue. This puts no. you in the darkest place this guy could possibly be, and then it's just done with him begging Panchu to make him a hero again. And yeah. like, yeah. that's really depressing and ultimately a sad <laughs> thing to bring to a desert island. But like, it stuck with me more than anything else. Like, it made me, yeah. it formed my love for my favorite character because it yeah. it left me with questions and it left me caring about this guy that i didn't know anything about other than he looked cool yeah and it's not like it was just a random thing that houston decided to do because there is a history of mark and his relationship with his uh, support network well and you know, it, not- it made going back and reading through all that and realizing what led to this it made all mm. of that it just it it really really worked Mm. And and I mean it's still something that we we definitely see now as well about how he's almost he's got this massive guilt complex of not only Mark Spector being a mercenary and what he did as a merc, but also what he has done to his own friends and 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 you see it later on in in the run with Houston and Benson, it's almost as if to save them he's just got to be a real dickhead and and not yeah. <laughs> be 
part of their lives, you know. And uh, so it's almost like a, it's like a no-win situation. And, and with the Jed McKay run, we get a reference, a great reference to Marlene and Dietrus. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've actually just moved the country, moved country again. It's not the ideal scenario you'd think Mark would want because he's you know he likes Marlene and, and all that so and he has a daughter uh, but yeah so incredibly flawed character and, and I think that's yeah that is the appeal as you say Drew and um, and issue one of this is just it's just so well done um, uh, uh, some people call it like uh, you know the the Dark Knight version like for Moon Knight this turned the corner for him brought him into the modern era I've had conversations with other loonies online as well, some of them saying that, you know, this in particular is the best run, everything else is rubbish, and so so I have to kind of try to I've mediate had, that. It's like, yeah, yeah, and, I, and I, I get how some people would, would feel that way, but, like, yeah. in my opinion, it this run has made every other run make... It, it's, for me, has made every other run more enjoyable in their own aspects, because mm. I think this took... I don't know the way that things have played off of what this set has allowed for so much good storytelling for him chad mckay being a shining example um mm-hmm. but it also took all of his past leading up to this and it did something meaningful with it whether that was yeah. you know upsetting or, or depressing or not it it worked with his history in a way that a lot of comics would just be like all right i don't know here's some characters that have been around and he's gonna go fight this thing now yeah, and yeah. Uh, it it really dug into the core of uh, of his flaws and his character building, uh, in my opinion. So yes, um, and yeah, just a couple things from the issue that really stuck out. I mean, obviously mm-hmm. the the opening, him saying the fun stuff. I think that's just yes. genius. Um, yeah, this obviously has the I wear white, so they'll see me coming line. Mm-hmm. That I yeah. when I first read that, I just was looking at my comic book like. This guy, this guy rules. <laughs> this is so cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, him saying that uh, the line I actually picked up from it today, where he says uh, a priest doesn't change the color of his vestments. Mm. I thought that was really cool because I didn't know anything about Kanshu. I didn't really understand mm-hmm. the gist of Kanshu until deep, you know, getting further into the reading him in general. Um, yeah. And then there was just a couple little things that I thought were really interesting upon rereading. Um, this whole part where after that opening fight scene is done you see um, him in bed with Marlene he's obviously just daydreaming about this because it's not reality anymore Um, Mm -hmm. but this obviously uh, listeners can't see but this panel here where uh, I never noticed that starting top to bottom Frenchie looks normal and he Mm -hmm. you know he goes and again and again over and over in the top, Frenchie looks normal. He's kissing Marlene. The second one, Frenchie's mustache gets longer and more like <sighs> stereotypical, and he yeah. he starts smiling more. Him and Marlene yeah. look a little more cartoonish. And then in yeah. the final panel, Frenchie's mustache is twirled out to here. He's got a fr- <laughs> he's got a French cigarette and a martini. Yeah. And him and Marlene look like anime characters kissing, basically. And I then, did not notice that. Yeah, though. and then the next page, it's him in a wheelchair, surrounded by drugs and booze, mm. like that illustration of him like his you can just watch this like his his mental collapse through the artwork and if you pay attention to the details it's just it's showing him beating people's asses in these side panels and what that's actually doing to the relationships in his life um and i never noticed how great the artwork is for how they illustrated that oh yeah a lot of subtleties in there as well i mean finch is a lot more than just you, you know the muscle-bound superhero type of art. Uh, there's a lot of consideration, and and whether that's in collaboration, of course, with with Charlie Houston, um, we can only speculate. But um, yeah, some really really great um, moments there uh, for for issue one as well. Uh, Moon Knight, yeah, it it's, remains one of my favourites. Um, the whole run, uh, I think, even the Benson run for me. I shouldn't say even the Benson run. I mean, both the Benson run and Houston run were just fantastic. Yeah, I actually, um, um I, I really ended up in, um, so like I said, I, I read a few of these and then I went back and read everything else. So it made more sense. Mm-hmm. And then when I got back into it, like, I really loved this, but I actually ended up really enjoying the Benson run coming out of it too. Mm. You get to see a bit of his, um, like a redemption for him, yeah. which after yeah. that art, he desperately needed cause it, it's rough. Oh. oh, absolutely. He's got a lot. Um, a lot going 
Well, uh, I mean, I think that about wraps us. Yeah, um, I mean, other than that, um, that, that that's pretty much all for that one. Like this. Yeah. It's just overall my my all time favorite single issue of a comic. So that one was an easy pick. That was an easy pick, and and I'm sure it's on many Looney's, um, you know, top lists, top four. Um, oh, actually, having said that, there's plenty of other Moon Knight issues as well that really, I mean, we, you know, the Lumiere run, you had a, you had a whole heap to choose from Lumiere. Yeah, and it was hard um, to not grab one from that. I just, uh, yeah. I probably definitely would have picked one of the Lumiere run ones, but I thought it'd be fun to switch it up with a couple other characters since we uh, figured if I'm going to only pick four, why not, like, really reach and see what other ones I can pull in. Yeah, no, no, for sure. But, um, Drew, thank you so much for... Uh, for spending the time and sharing your top four Desert Island books. I've wanted to have you on the Isle of Ra for so long. Um, of course, I've always been interested in doing one, and it's been fun hopping around the the, the yeah. varied rooms of the House of Shadows. <laughs> well, we're here in, in New York now, which is pretty cool. It's still a bit far from, from Chicago, but I'm sure we can holler Frenchie to, to whip up a moon copter for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, before you go, though, uh, is there anything that um, I'll put everything on the show notes from you know the lcs to uh, to your music as well but is there anything uh, else that you want to plug or shout out and, um, and if so where can they find you yeah so i mean i have all my socials uh on instagram it's tombs official with a z uh twitter tombs with i think three z's so t-o-m-b-z-z-z mm-hmm. facebook tombs t-o-m-b-z um yeah, that's all of my music social soundcloud uh slash tombs um mm-hmm. if you want to listen to my lurk music um it's uh band camp lurk music with a ck um mm-hmm. yeah I, I i update all those myself um don't have any i might have a, a remix coming out sometime over the next few weeks but yeah there'll be new music in september for sure uh mm-hmm. and i sent a couple of my dj mixes to the chat so maybe we can put those yes. in the show notes so get a, get an idea of what like an hour long set sounds like um, yeah that's Absolutely. really all i got to plug right now I was uh, working on new music and should hopefully have a bunch of stuff coming out in the fall well loonies check all check all of that out in the show notes it should all be there um it's been an absolute pleasure drew and just off the cuff now what i'm thinking of if with your permission um, we might take out this show as the moon copter whips you away um, can we play one of your your uh your tracks oh absolutely yeah just let me know which one you want and i'll I'll send one over as drew climbs up the rope ladder and is whisked away by frenchie on the moon copter i want to leave you loony listeners with one of drew's songs called three six um go check it out if you love it go check out all the links in the show notes um catch you later drew um watch your step as you go up adios it was a pleasure everybody All right, ladies, catch you later.
affiliated characters, stories and events are properties of Marvel Characters Incorporated. Materials used and discussed within the podcast are intended for critique and review purposes only under the fair dealing concept of the current Copyright Act. The views, information or opinions expressed during the podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the copyright owners.